name is Carlton Leg, and welcome to the Avro Area Industrial Museum. This is a first. We're having a speaker series, and this is our first one. And we're lucky enough to have Betsy Dexter Dyer talk about ice harvesting. And Betsy's from Walpole. She's a professor emeritus at Wheaton College. Got a few books to uh, supplement this presentation. She's got this great field guide here of uh, bacteria, too, yep. which um, I thought was interesting. Because I'm a science, past science teacher, you need to have a field guide of bacteria. So she's going to sh share uh, Walpole ice harvesting, and we have a little 12 minute film about ice harvesting right here in Attleboro on Cooper's Pond. So enjoy. Okay, thank you, Carlton. Uh, I um, developed this talk for Walpole, Massachusetts, where I've been living for 31 years, but I have modified it a little bit for Attleboro because when Carlton suggested that I give this talk here, I said, well, this folks are going to be from Attleboro. We're going to have a very exciting fit film to see at the end, by the way. You're going to love it. But I, I realized that, that Attleboro and Walpole have a lot in common in respect to their history of ice harvesting. So I think you can do some take-home stories from what I found out in Walpole when I did this research. So I'm calling this Take Home Stories for Attleboro and maybe ways to, to further investigate Attleboro's history of, of, of ice harvesting. First of all, we both have a lot of industrial mill ponds. And industrial mill ponds can get polluted if there are upstream industries. And polluted ponds are not good for harvesting ice. So I think it's going to be a reason that Attleboro and Walpole were relatively late in the game and only with very specific ponds that, that had ice harvested on them. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Secondly, few or no glacial ponds of the right size. Not in Walpole, not in Attleboro. I'll, see you, I'll show you a rather striking map that I think will convince you. And maybe after the talk, someone can go, no, 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 you, we've got a glacial pond in Attleboro. Not a big one, not the really big ones that they were harvesting ice from up in northern New England. Despite memories, this is what I found out in Walpole, artificially produced ice started to become more important starting in the 1920s. They still might have been storing the ice in ice houses. They still had ice wagons going around and ice boxes, that's for sure. Um, but when I started to talk to old timers in town about what they remembered, I really had to sort out. Were they literally cutting the ice or were they making it artificially? So watch for that if you're researching Attleboro. We're going to see a beautiful video from the 1930s. But you may also have had artificial ice being brought in for people's ice boxes. Here's another thing that I found out. Often, it was a big out-of-town operator who had ponds leased all over Massachusetts, all over New England, who was simply adding to their repertoire of ponds. Um, not sure it's entirely true for Attleboro. It was definitely true for Walpole, and I'll give you the examples. But sometimes it was done on the stealth because it was big money and big business to go in and get a pond lease. So the locals wouldn't necessarily know who was cutting the ice. But in fact, it was from uh, an operator from out of town. Um, if you see a little tiny ice harvesting operation, um, I won't talk about any today, um, but if you ever see one in Attleboro, look for the dairy. As soon as the milk purity laws started to take effect in the early 20th century, it became essential to get milk onto ice within a few minutes at a certain temperature um, in order to, to keep it to, to deliver. And oftentimes, a, a, a dairy will have associated with it a little ice cutting operation or a little ice storage operation just for its own use. Same with slaughterhouses. And I have a nice example of that from Walpole. And then ice house fires. I found that when I talked to old timers in Walpole and to my father, who grew up in Framingham, Eota Steyer, um, what they really remembered, because they were boys, big ice house fires because there was the, it was the end of the ice house industry and if those house, ice houses were not taken down board by board and reused, which they were in many cases, they went up in a conflagration because the ventilation in an empty ice house is like a chimney. And so some of the most spectacular fires um, written up in the 1930s and 40s were of ice houses. 
briefly how it's done, briefly because we're going to see the most amazing video at the end of this. So this is just going to be a little tidbit, a little outline, and then you're going to see the whole thing laid out in action, narrated, which is amazing. Uh, this is Spy Pond, which by the way is a glacial pond up in Cambridge, 1854. A very important pond in the ice harvesting industry. This is a, an iconic picture. What's nice about it is we can see every single step along the way that I'm just going to briefly tell you. First step is you have horses pulling, whoops, pulling, I meant to use my pointer, pulling plow-like apparatuses, but hey, guess what? We've got one right here and we've got another one right here. So imagine this being a, a, a human here and the horse attached at this end not cutting all the way through the ice, but scoring it. Scoring it in two directions. You can see that we've got essentially the blocks all laid out the way they're going to be stored, but they're only being scored at this point with this plow-like apparatus. Next step, we have men with saws. And where are the men with saws? Trust me, there's some men with saws in here somewhere that are cutting the ice along the scores to make elongated rectangular blocks, okay? Then other men are guiding the rectangular blocks in the direction of the ice houses back there. And then as those blocks approach the ice houses, men with chisel-like, um, giant chisels, I'll show you a picture of one, are gonna snap the final block off where it was scored and then it'll be stored in the ice house. Now for some pictures, but then we'll look forward to seeing a video of it actually happening. All right, there we go. There's essentially the plow that we're looking at right here in this room that they dragged out for us to see, scoring the ice. Woods Hole, by the way, had a big ice industry. They have a lot of glacial kettle ponds there. Um, people had to use um, cleats on their feet. The horses had to use cleats on their uh, hooves in order to negotiate walking on the ice. Really heavy saws, and I know we've got one hanging on the wall over there. I've tried to lift the one that we have at the Walpole Historical Society, and I can scarcely lift it off the ground. It's so heavy, so absolutely amazing. There's a man bringing that saw up and down. Here I am lifting another really heavy thing. This is an ice splitting fork from our collection, and I think Carlton's got one too in his collection. Also very heavy, this is your final step. Boom, down goes this ice splitting fork on that final, um, serration in the ice, and then you've broken off a block. And then how are we guiding the ice along? We're using all sorts of ice picks. All right, but that's it for now. You'll see it in action. So here I want to, to talk about Walpole and Attleboro's unique history of ice harvesting. Here's Walpole. We're not going to spend too much time on this map except for me to point out that it's all mill ponds. This is the Neponset River going through here. These are tributaries to the Neponset. Attleboro has a similar situation with its rivers. All dammed up, all industry. It's all about these towns. This is why these towns are here, because we had rivers and we could dam them up. So next slide shows you Attleboro. I don't, didn't have an historic slide of Attleboro. But look, here's Orr's Pond, Dodgeville Pond, Cooper's Pond and a little bit more on Manchester in a second. We're gonna get Manchester uh, off the talk in just a minute. But anyway, Coopers, Dodgeville, and Orris, those are the ponds I'm gonna tell you about. Those are mill ponds. Those are on your rivers and tributaries. Um, what do I wanna say about Manchester Pond? It's man-made, it's a reservoir. It was made in 1963. Even though when you drive by it on Route 95 and think, my goodness, what a great ice pond this would have been. No, it was not, okay? Now, in fact, I'm old enough to remember when it appeared because my father pointed it out to us. It's like, look, suddenly this is giant pond, huge pond, Manchester Pond. So no, no more about Manchester, but lots more about Cooper's Dodgeville and Orris coming up. All right, here, isn't this interesting? I'm so glad I found this map. Walpole is about yay here, Attleboro is about yay here. This is showing you the large kettle ponds in Massachusetts. And by the way, if you go up north, there's even more. And look how packed with, with kettle ponds Cape Cod is. The glacier left a whole bunch of ponds there. 
we just don't have a whole lot of glacial ponds. There might be some little hole in the woods or something that someone identifies as glacial, but we didn't have that kind of opportunity for an ice industry that other places in Massachusetts had. Walden Pond is a cattle pond, and it's a, a famous ice harvesting venue as well. All right, so now I'm gonna get down to three Walpole ponds. The first one I'm going to mention is Maury's Pond, um, but the Turner family, the name eventually became Turner's Pond, were huge operators on this pond. So uh, maybe some of you know Walpole, so I'm giving you both names, Maury's and, and, and Turner's Pond. Look how late these dates are. 1881 is very late to get into the game of ice harvesting. Uh, Frederick Tudor, figured out how to harvest ice efficiently and store ice efficiently back in the 1830s. People were going strong in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s. I suspect it might be true for Attleboro too that we were relatively late in the game because we didn't have big glacial kettle ponds. We had mill ponds that you could only use very carefully around potential pollution. Uh, 1936 is a typical cutoff date for cutting uh, ice on a pond. So 1881 to 1836. And next I'm gonna show you um, what it looks like on a bird's eye map. Watch for this on your own bird's eye map. Sometimes there'll be an ice house shown. It's worth looking at the bottom of a bird's eye map to see if you can see one. Here is E. Frank Lewis's ice houses, that big block of buildings right there, next to the pond that he was using for his mill, which was a wool scouring mill. So that's a lot of detail about him, but I'm gonna to get to some pollution caused by that wool scouring mill in just a minute that's gonna be relevant. All right, so E. Frank Lewis was the first person to harvest ice in, on, on Maury's Pond. Nowadays, I'm told, I've been down in this area here, here's where the ice house was, here's where the mill site was. I've been told you can go down there and see foundations for the old ice house, but foundations for ice houses are very, very simple. I'll show you some that I actually found in the woods at, on, on a later slide. Um, it's actually fairly difficult to find an ice house foundation. So even though I've been down here in all the weeds and, and, and et cetera, I did not see a foundation, but that's kind of the way the site looks today. And this is one of my favorite newspaper quotes. This is from the 1883 Walpole Star, which we just got digitized, so now things are really easy to find in it. What I love about this is because ice harvesting was a spectacle. It was entertainment, and it was all out where you could see it. Imagine a factory tour that you didn't have to get special permission to get inside and see the machinery running. It was just all out there on the pond. You just had to walk from downtown and, and go and observe it. So here's what people observed and here's what was reported in the newspaper. About 60 men employed around the clock, aided by moonlit night. I'll explain why in a second, it'll make sense to you. Mr. Lewis, the owner, provide hot chocolate, sandwiches and cheese. 6,000 tons, it, it just always oh, amazing to me, the tonnage, cut and put away. And then I love this, a huge crowd assembled, including not a few ladies, to witness the spectacle. If you've ever been, had the privilege of going on a factory tour, you know it's a big deal to get permission. Here you just walk and observe and see everything happening all at once. All right, what's up with them working around the clock? I don't know if you've ever been, either ever observed or participated in haying season where time is of the essence, you've cut the hay, and now you're hoping it doesn't rain, and you're, you got it all kind of raked up, and you're, and you're bailing, and you're, I hope it still doesn't rain, and you're working flat out to get that hay into the barn. Same with ice. What happens? It freezes, and then, oh my goodness, we're gonna get a melt next week. So when the ice froze to the correct depth, people just descended. They would bring in people from other towns, gangs of men from other towns. I'm sure they did in Attleboro, too. All right, but something went terribly wrong here. From 1885 to 1890, five years worth of court work. Imagine if the lawyers got paid handsomely for this, and they did, I think. A costly and acrimonious lawsuit that was dragged out between Lewis, he's the one that owned the mill and the ice houses, and all the folks downstream from him, Bird, Vose, 
Stetson, and others. These are all the downstream mills. And Bird was a big name in Walpole. You might recognize it. Bird machine and Bird shingle and Bird linoleum and all that stuff. Bose is still in business in Walpole. So back to this. Let me remind you, he has ice houses and a wool scouring mill. Hmm, maybe there's something going on with a wool scouring mill. Yes, according to the court's transcript, and we're lucky that we actually have the court transcripts. It's great. Um, great quantities of grease and sheep dung and other substances called lumps of animal matter are floating downstream from E. Frank Lewis's business. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, wool scouring, isn't that cleaning wool? Yeah, you use a kind of a big set of tubs like this, automated, the wool is going from tub to tub and the, the dirty water is going out into the river, of course, this is something like what he would have been using. How bad could it be? If you've ever seen sheep being sheared at a country fair, it doesn't look like a filthy mess. Okay, it does when you're doing tons and tons of wool per day because they're doing a pretty quick job of it and all kinds of debris is in the back end of the wool, et cetera, et cetera. And they were doing 9.5 tons of wool per day and using 57 pounds of soap per day, according to the court transcripts, and pouring it all down river. Now, let's see where he was. He's up here at Maury's Pond, which is a tributary to the Neponset. There's nobody upstream of him. His water is pristine and clear. He can cut the ice. Now comes his dirty water, down, 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 down. It hits Stetson's pond, polluted. It goes further, it's gonna hit Bird's pond and Bose's ponds further down. So these guys were saying, you're not only affecting our ability to harvest ice, but you're also just affecting our wash waters that we're using for our businesses. By the way, upstream, they had their own problems. We didn't have any ice harvesting here, here, and here, because believe me, the Neponset is, uh, it was pretty, pretty well used in those days, as your rivers were too. By 1890, Lewis actually gave up and left town and built mills in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Now, don't feel sorry for him. I'm gonna show you his mill in Lawrence. Whoa. So all I can say about Lewis is they claim him in Lawrence. If you go up to the Lawrence, uh, in, what do they call it up there? And you go to their archives, and yeah, he's our guy. E. Frank Lewis is our guy. He was your guy for a little while, but now he's our guy. So he's, a, he's really a Lawrence person. Don't feel sorry for him. He made out extremely well for himself. And I don't think he ever cut any ice again either. And so who took over this pond is Spear. And I'm showing you this just because you can find in old directories really nice little ads for ice dealers. It's worth looking through your own Attleboro directories for this. Um, so here he is, he's cutting ice on Maury's Pond and he's taken over the Lewis business now that Lewis has gone to Lawrence. And Sanborn maps are fabulous. Okay, I highly recommend pouring over Sanborn maps if you possibly can. If an ice house was insured and they were not always insured for fire because a Sanborn map is a fire insurance map. So it's usually showing you the industries that were insured for fire. But if, if you are lucky, your ice house was insured. Here's an 1894 Sanborn. Um, they didn't come out every year. And here's Spears Ice House. And by the way, that's a ramp. We're gonna see that ramp in use in this video. So keep an eye on, 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 on think, or think about ramps and see, we'll see how they're used. And next door was the mill. All right, so Sanborn maps, highly recommend them. Then here's something that happened quite a bit in Walpole and I think some other small towns. Spear quietly added a partner and he was Jacob Arthur Turner of Milton Ice who was an ice mogul all over Massachusetts. He, he didn't always buy ponds but he would lease ponds. Leasing a pond was a thing. Leasing ice houses was a thing and Jacob Arthur Turner quietly was added as a partner. Why quietly? Probably he didn't want to alert his competitors that he was doing this and jack the price up so that we had like a bidding war on, on leasing this particular pond. And by 1896, they called themselves the Walpole Ice Company, but I say people in town still didn't know Turner was around. He didn't live there. He lived in Milton. He was a very rich person. All right, big ice, I came across lots of ice house fires. I'm not gonna tell you about all of them, but here's an example. The Turner Spear ice houses went up in a huge conflagration in 1900. 
And it was here that the newspaper first just started to say, gee, it looks like Turner's involved here. This was their first inkling. And anyway, the ice houses went up in a spectacular fire for a complete loss. They rebuilt them within months. These were really flimsy buildings, very simple foundation. All you need is some walls and a well-ventilated roof and you're back in action. So I actually watched in the newspapers as they rebuilt the ice house as quickly as they could for the next season. So in no time at all, they, were, they had recovered from it. All right, by 1900, Jacob Arthur Turner of Milton Ice owned the entire business and all of the property. And little by little by little was called Turner's Pond. So he had arrived, but not really. He still lived in Milton, but he started to install family members in Walpole to control this piece of ice. And then 1911 Sanborn, by then it's called the, the J.A. Turner Ice house. He's, it, it, remember, we had a big fire, so this is a, a new ice house, and he's got a different configuration for his ramp by 1911. But here's something interesting. By 1932, Milton Ice Company, the big ice mogul company, started making artificial ice. They made it at a plant up in Mattapan, actually. Um, and it became a thing. Here's the ad from the newspaper. No ice shortage will be found and will be felt in Walpole. That's why artificial ice became so important. People were still using ice boxes, but they didn't want that, oh, gee, we've run out of ice. We can't cut anymore till next February, sorry. So artificial ice became something important as, ice be as people became more and more dependent upon it. And so they started using their ice houses for storing artificial ice. Little bit of a disappointment, but something that we have to acknowledge if we're studying this. Probably 1936 was the last ice harvest on that pond. And by the way, you don't know who Roger Turner Jr. is, but he died a couple of years ago. He was one of my oral history um, confidants in this. He's the grandson of Jacob Arthur Turner. And he, one of his first childhood memories was some of the workers, because they had a huge gang of workers, setting him, age four years old, all bundled up in a snowsuit on top of one of those ice blocks and sending him down the channel. And all I can think of as a mother is, they better have been watching that child carefully. Oh my goodness. And then months later, one of the largest fires in Walpole history, and that, wall, and that ice house complex went up in smoke again, typical. Roger told me he thought it was a disgruntled employee. We don't know, it wasn't in the newspaper. Now you're probably feeling sorry for the Turner family. There's gonna be a little digression. Don't feel sorry for this family. They're very rich too, so don't worry about that. Just in case you're feeling sorry for the dad, he was a famous ice skater. He learned to skate on his family's pond in Milton he was United States figure skating champion. He was a world North American and Paris champion. He was in the Olympics. He was in the Olympics. And to this day remains tied with Dick Button for the most consecutive US championship win wins. You can find him in the Figure Skating Hall of Fame. He co-finder of the Boston Skating Club. So after the ice houses burned, I kind of get the feeling from his son, Roger Turner Jr that it wasn't a complete disaster. They started putting on ice spectacles on that pond. And because he knew all the Olympic folks in the area, these were huge gala events. I won't digress more on that, except to say that Olympic ice skaters were skating on that pond. Could they have done it while they were harvesting ice? No, because here's an interesting coincidence. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. When the ice is ready to harvest, it's also ready to skate on. Oops. <laughs> so one of the things that I noticed in the newspaper, and you might notice this too if you go looking at Attleboro newspapers, is there would be huge skating parties like the night before the ice harvesters were to come, right? Because it's pretty much the only time you could have a huge skating party um, on, a, on a real ice harvesting pond. Just one example, this was his second carnival. He, every year he had a carnival and it was always like the front page of the Walpole Times. And the Milton Ice Company, remember they're making artificial ice by this point, this is the 1940s, is calling themselves formerly the Milton Ice Company and they're actually going into fuel oils. So like I said, don't feel sorry for this family, they recovered, they're making artificial ice, they're doing fuel oils, they've got an Olympic champion in the family, so don't worry about them. All right, Diamond Pond is my second Walpole Pond of three that I'll tell you about. 
Look how brief the history of that was. There's a really interesting story. They get started late, typical, but they get finished pretty early too, which is kind of strange. What happened? And it was one of our more pure ponds, or at least they called themselves that, and the Walpole Star called their ice of wonderful purity, which is where I took the name for this talk. And here it is looking kind of diamond shaped. And what's nice about it is this is not the Neponset River, this is a tributary. There is no upstream industry, so the water really was nice and pure, just like you would want it. There's no ice house there yet. There's a cotton mill right there, probably polluting downstream from it, but not, not doing anything to the pond itself. Here we go with, a, with another nice advertisement for Diamond Pond Ice, Pure Pond Ice delivered, and the owner at that time was, was guiled. And here we can see, and, and you really can't see it, you have to trust that there's a little ice house right there. So they've installed an ice house by 1888 alongside the cotton mill, so a typical thing to do if you're gonna do this at all. So everything's going great until this happened. A brand new rail line went through Walpole, it's a branch, to East Walpole to actually service Bird Mill was I think one of the big purposes in 1892. Now all kinds of shenanigans happened as this rail line was gonna be set out. First of all, people were jacking up the price for their land because the rail line was gonna to have to buy land all along the way. So there's a lot of excitement about that. And then there was a lot of excitement by businesses along the way as to exactly where the rail line was going because there's nothing like having a business right next to a rail line or close enough to have a little spur. So there was just a huge amount of stuff going on leading up to this big moment when the first train went through. And one of the big lobbyists were the owners of Diamond Pond. They really, really, really wanted that train to go not just past Diamond Pond, but kind of across Diamond Pond, if you can imagine that. Across Diamond Pond would be ideal for them. Now, I wanna show you a little something. This is a 1933 assessor's map, only because it shows something. Here's the, here's the rail. See this rail going straight, 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 straight. Here, see it doing a little curve? See it going across Diamond Pond? When someone's laying a railroad track, they like it to go as straight as they can for as long as they can, don't they? They're not like looking for ways to bend it. Nor are they looking for an opportunity to build something across a pond. There was a lot of lobbying that went into getting this thing to curve ever so slightly and to go right there. All right. And here's an, this is, this is actually probably not accurate. This is a Sanborn map showing a really, like, eh, eh. see how it, I mean, it really doesn't make a bend like that, but it curves, it curves toward the pond. They wanted it that way. Suddenly the ice on Diamond Pond couldn't be sold anymore. Why? Because of this. So apparently a, a, a big old fashioned steam train with coal or, or whatever they're fueling it with that is going either up a grade or with a huge, huge load of something like ice or coal or whatever it's carrying, just throws off a whole lot of cinders and soot and all kinds of things. And suddenly it, the, the pond water was essentially not pure anymore. Doesn't matter how few the ashes were, just a few ashes in water would make it not saleable. So very suddenly, you can actually see it in the newspaper. Um, and here's the railroad, this is a modern day picture, crossing Diamond Pond, it's no longer diamond shape here. Uh, that railroad no longer runs, by the way, which is why it looks like there are houses in the middle of it. Okay, that railroad is long gone, but the old railroad bed can be seen. Um, but my daughter has a drone, so I couldn't resist showing a drone picture of this. Here's Diamond Pond from, from a drone. You can see the former almost diamond shape here. Um, but it's a highly built up area right now. All right, so that's the story of Diamond Pond and that, that's why that was a very brief history. Sometimes what you want, the train to go through your business doesn't work out so well. Um, Clark's Pond, also sometimes called Spring Brook after the ice company that was um, there for many years, is also very late to begin and I'm gonna explain why because it could be relevant to Attleboro as well but then goes all the way to 1944. So it's our longest ice harvesting story. 
All right, so here is the Clark's Pond Conservation. Uh, well, it's, it's now a conservation area. Here is Clark's Pond. What, you're, what, what you should know is that the water connects here. This is not showing this accurately. The water connects, so it's all one great big pond, but with two lobes. The ice harvesting was going on on the big lobe, all right? But if you go back to 1852, Here's Clark's Pond, doesn't look anything like that, all right? And if you go to the 1870s, it doesn't look like that. So something happened to Clark's Pond. And before that, it probably wasn't so good for ice harvesting, all right? So it was not a big two-lobed pond. Here it is in 1888. There it is right there, not looking like what I just showed you, all right? So what happened around 1888, a little bit after, guy named Clark started really doing things you can't do anymore. I can tell you, I'm on conservation commission in Walpole. You're not allowed to dam things up and reroute streams and, and create new ponds and all that kind of thing and redire redirect a brook. He redirected a brook. He really worked hard in that area and completely transformed it. And so what we really have is this is all new in 1888. The original spring brook went out here somewhere. Let's not worry about that because you're not from Walpole and you're not concerned about where our brooks used to go. But this is all brand new in 1888. All right, so that's why we didn't cut ice there before. And around 1899, Clark established the Springbrook Ice Company, which is one of our canonical ice companies in Walpole. Some of the finest ice ever cut. And I'm gonna show you the new wagons of the Springbrook Ice Company because they're charming. Oh, not just yet. I'll show them eventually. Um, and in 1904, we begin a series of transfers, some of them secret. I had to go to the Registry of Deeds to figure this out, because again, people thought the Clarks just owned it the whole time. Nope, little by little, the rights to the ice and the pond were transferred. Here are the Springbrook ice wagon pictures. I should have put them first. All right. Before I get to further transfers, I got so excited when I saw this. Springbrook Ice Services, these are the kind of cards people would put in their windows to indicate to the ice man how much ice they wanted, 15 pounds, 20 pounds, 25 pounds. You'd set this in your window, the ice man would come along, horse and wagon. My father um, remembers this from Framingham, that it was a, a horse with a wagon. Well, it turns out that there are a lot of spring brooks. Apparently, it's a real good name for an ice business. So it turns out to be New Britain, Connecticut. If you can ever get a hold of any ice cards from any business in Attleboro, do you have any, Carlton? I don't. See, they're hard to get. If you have any at home kicking around the attic, please donate them to Carlton. And if you find Walpole ones, donate them to, to us, please. We don't have any. Where do they go? All right. So here's a picture of our ice house at Clark's Pond. This is the first ice house. Now, you can just barely see it because I want to point so something out about this building right here. You can just about see the ramp there. All right, so you got to trust me. That is an ice house at Clark's Pond, dated 1911, by the way. This is a slaughterhouse. So this was a very common pairing of businesses, especially in the early 20th century. Again, as laws got stricter about what you could and couldn't do with meat and milk, right? So this was a perfect combination. So Springbrook was a, both a slaughterhouse and an ice business. And they were killing a lot of chickens. You need to put chickens on ice pretty fast. Don't ask me where they were putting the waste. Well, OK, you can ask me. There was a hole in the floor. I've seen it. And the stream went underneath it. So downstream got a little polluted. So here we are with two ice houses. So here's our slaughterhouse. Here's our small ice house next to it. But then they expanded, and they made this great big ice house right here. Here you can see the ramp right there. I'm going to show you some great pictures of this in just a bit. All right, so Clark's Pond is going strong as an ice harvesting and slaughterhouse business. Here is a nice picture of a ramp going up at the Clark's Pond Ice House, taken from some viewpoint, I'm not sure, probably the 1920s. And look what happened. The Milton Ice Company again. That's the Turners. They came in very quietly and started storing artificial ice 
in some of the ice house space. Not all of it, they were still cutting a little bit of ice, but here's the Turners again um, coming in, and by the time they were done, they owned the whole thing. Don't they already own something in town? Yep, are they from town? No, they're from Milton. So this was a big surprise even to people who live in Walpole now who were convinced the Turners had nothing to do with that pond because they did it quietly. You know, a, a big name like the Turners is not going to announce, I'm about to buy your pond, what price would you like for it? So it was all done, I followed it in the Registry of Deeds, it was all done in a stealthy manner. Round about 1940, they decided they were going to have their last ice harvest. They continued to, um, for a little while, to put artificial ice into those ice houses. But a couple of high school students took some of the last photos of an ice harvest in Walpole, and they were probably working on the harvest. They'd get high school boys to, to come in from the neighborhood and do things. But at this point, it's the Turner's harvest. So this is not gonna be as good as the film that we're gonna show you in just a bit. So I won't linger on this too long. I was thrilled with this until I saw the film that you guys are gonna show us. And then I'm like, these pictures are crummy compared to what we're gonna see. Uh, here we are, a giant ramp, you're gonna see that in the film. So, okay, I was thrilled with this until I saw your film. Here's a watercolor by a Walpole High School student. This I do like, showing just a really beautiful idealized picture of an of a, of a, um, ice house. This is the ice house on Clark's Pond. Um, if it weren't for the Great Depression, I think he would have become a, a more of a commercial artist when I went to look to see what had become of his going to art school during the Depression. The answer was, you cannot be an artist, apparently, and make any money during the Great Depression. All right. A little more of ice harvesting taken by those high school boys. And then practically the next year, a couple years later, the ice house looks like that. It looks like it's ready to burn down, doesn't it? Yep. 1944, the old ice house went up in a spectacular blaze that could be seen as far away as Norwood. Um, and I had the, a, an indirect eyewitness account of that. She died in 2010, so I got to talk to her daughter-in-law, who had heard all about this. Apparently, it was a controlled burn. It was not arson. So apparently, what would sometimes happen in those days is, I guess you'd get permission from the fire department. I don't know. I'd like to think so. And you go, I, I don't want this ice house anymore. Um, and it went out of control. They weren't intending to, to do quite what ended up happening, but she said it was a controlled burn. Here's the foundation. So see how simple that foundation is in the woods? Um, it's, it's, you didn't need much of a foundation. All you're doing is putting up some boards. Most of the structure is the ice and the insulation between the blocks of ice. You need it well ventilated at the top. Um, but that's about it. Actually, you need good drainage out the bottom, so you don't want to have too much of a foundation, so you're collecting melt water. Another little bit of the foundation that can be found in the woods next to Clark's Pond, and I have other pictures too, but I won't linger on those, because I want to get to Attleboro. All right, so here we are back um, with Orr's Pond, Dodgeville Pond, and Cooper's Pond. As far as I know, those are your three big ponds for this, but I'd love to hear otherwise if you know of others. Here's Orr's Pond, as it is today. And here is a Sanborn map that I found online. If you can ever get an actual paper Sanborn, it's a spectacular thing to see. I need to orient you a little bit. Pay no attention to Cumberland Avenue. This is a line that tells us we have two separate maps here. Sanborn was very conservative. They would show one little map and then another one right next to it. So this is not near Cumberland Ave. It is near West. And there is an ice house right there, and it's the Charles Bloss Ice House near West Street. Okay? So I went and looked up Charles Bloss and found out that he was indeed an ice dealer in the 1900 and 1920 censuses and lived on Newport Avenue. Doesn't necessarily say whether he himself was actively cutting the ice. You have to kind of sort that out. Ice dealer could mean he owned something and, and then brought in gangs of people to do it, or he was literally organizing it himself. But I wanted to show you this. You can go to an Attleboro directory, and I only went to one of them, only to your 1901 directory, all you got to do is look up ice dealers, and you'll pretty much get a list of who at least was active in, in, with some kind of a substantial business as of 1901. 
Who's this John Thatcher? He's your Attleboro Ice and Coal guy, and that business is still extant. That's one of our oldest businesses. I've come across two different spellings of his name. Sometimes there's a T thrown in there, so watch for that. All right. And also in your directories, watch for paid advertising. Here's your Attleboro Ice and Coal Company right there. This is your 1911 Attleboro directory. So if, if, if I were doing this, I would like want to go through each directory one page at a time and see what I could see. Here's Dodgeville Pond. And there, by the way, is Thatcher Street. And I'll bet that's named after that Thatcher, OK? And Dodgeville Pond was one of the ice ponds used for the Attleboro Ice and Coal. Um, and apparently that business was founded by Carol Thatcher, spelled however, and they also cut ice on Cooper's Pond, and Cooper's Pond is the one we're going to see a video of in just a little bit. Is Don Doucette here by chance? Okay. Thank you, Don Doucette, for putting fun stuff like this on the internet. All right? Because I don't know this. This is... Thank you, Don Doucette. All right. And then here is the... Ice House on Dodge Pond, and it's here. See how it's kind of halfway off the map? That tells me it probably wasn't insured. A lot of people wouldn't insure their ice houses. It tells me that they were insuring this, which is the Attleboro Steam and Electric Company, and the only reason they put the ice house there was because if it went up in flames, it would have an effect on surrounding buildings. So, that, so remember, a Sanborn map is a fire insurance map. So I'm, I suspect that we don't get to see the whole ice house because it, it itself was not insured. OK? Um, so ice house on Dodge Pond. And here's Cooper's Pond. And Carlton just told me yesterday that the reason it's cut off like this is because the railroad went through and did some filling. I thought it was some kind of a huge dam. But no, apparently the railroad goes through there or used to go through there. Um, so Cooper's Pond looking a little bit strange in modern day picture. And now we segue to our film. I'm going to do two more slides just to acknowledge some people, but we're about to see a film of Cooper's Pond that I actually think is so spectacular that I thought about it overnight. I got to see it yesterday when, when Carlton was setting it up. Overnight, I thought, you've got to make a copy of this and send it to the Smithsonian. I, from, from all the research that I've done on ice ponds, I don't think there's a whole lot of videos like this. I really don't. OK, I happen to have written a book. Uh, called Up Wonderful Purity. This was for the Walpole Historical Society, so it's pretty exhaustive. If you've heard me talk, you know I can be exhaustive. Not exhausting, I hope. <laughs> and I have a lot of thank yous. Won't go through these because you're not from Walpole. You don't recognize names necessarily, except to say that some of my most important acknowledgments are to people who were witnesses. They were witnesses as boys. If you can get a hold of any witnesses, and start interviewing them now while you have a chance. I'm getting teary-eyed because my father was one and he died last year. Start interviewing them now about what they've seen. All right, thank you. We was taken by L. Louise Cooper in the mid to late 1930s, several years time. Eighteen hundreds by F.P. Cooper, with the help of the Harvey brothers from Chartley. There were three original rooms made by setting chestnut poles in the ground with boards nailed on each side and filled with sawdust for insulation. There was one flat roofed room was added about 1930. Each room was about 30 feet wide, 60 feet long, 30 feet high, with a total capacity of about 6,000 tons of ice. Ice cutting would start when the ice was 12 inches thick. The first groove was made with a hand-operated marker. The rest were cut with a power saw set to cut 9 inches deep to make blocks 2 feet by 3 feet. Each blade block weighed about 300 pounds. Originally, the ice was cut with horse-drawn plows. Uh, 
Now, this shows us off. Lower down and cut the groove. That's Harry Manchester, and Joe Fisher pulling the saw. It's one of the Lange boys walking by. A couple other kids there pushing the flows up. Another view of cutting the, pulling the saw. This is a good view of the ice going up the run. So they take a section out and let it come down the horizontal runs. This is Albert and Frederick and the other two, Lee and Buddy, I believe. Joe Fisher pulling the saw alone. Shows the guide bar that followed in the groove to make them the, all the same width. So they had to saw down one side of the flow so they could break it off. Oops, and Dickie Tingley fell down. Shows him pulling the flows up the channel, up towards the water box. There's the ice going up the chain. That's a view from underneath the icicles hanging down. When it goes up, it goes under a planer up in here. The planes of the ice are all the same thickness. There's a view late afternoon through the rigging of the ice house. So the flow's coming up the channel. The, uh, some ride on them, some walk along pulling them. There's the boat they used to uh, row up and down the channel all night to keep it from freezing. That's Austin Cooper. Keeps the whole show working. That's a good view down the part of the channel. The way down here where they're still cutting. Gives you some idea of the size of the pond. This is a pile of broken cakes. As they come down the run, if they're broken, they let them slide right off the end instead of putting them in the room. Some girls out for an afternoon walk. That's Walter Cooper on the top. Get the next run ready. Shows the ice coming down. I switch some in, let some by, so they all fill up the same rate. That shows a good view of the, the three original rooms with a peaked roof. Down this end here was where the flat room was added. Another view down the pond. And we are. Uh, when they first start a field, they have to saw out one row of blocks and push them out by hand so they have room to uh, break the next flow off. Then they have to saw down one side so they can break the other side off. There's, I think there goes one now. Now this pond, this place was about six feet deep. That shows breaking off another flow. There's Albert, Lee, Buddy, Frederick in the background. I was sawing up near there. Another year they're sawing up near the ice house again, starting off. We are cutting down one side of the field there so it can break them off. There are the flows of the 
The wind is pushing them up this time, so we don't have to pull them. And stick patting this time, cutting down the side. Those saws are about six feet tall. That's Ralph Hall playing with his dog. This is a view of the ice flows coming up to what they call a water box. That's a new view from the other side. Any ice that's cut has to be got in that day or the uh, grooves will freeze up again. This is Ralph Palmer up here where they come through the water box, they break off a single strip and they feed them through and then break them into individual cakes. And the chain comes under the ice, picks it up, and carries it up the run. And it comes down along the top here. The return, chain returns. There we are. Switch so many in the room, let so many by. Now, this is a view inside the room where the cakes come down the run. They had two by fours with lag screws in them to slow the ice down if it came down so it wouldn't come down too fast. That's a good view of the ice house. The ice goes up the chain here and they take a section of this run out so they can ride down the whichever run they want to fill the house, the ice house. The clutch room up here where Adna Cummings sat all day with a lantern under his feet to keep his feet warm. He had a cowbell up there with a string that ran the whole length of the ice house. If anybody wanted to, and it ran down here too, anybody wanted to shut it off, they'd pull the string and ring the cowbell. He'd shut the chain off. These ice houses were built. So it was a water Shows the water box down here with the, the run coming up here and all the four levels of runs across the front. The three original rooms and over here there was a, a small addition put on and this is the big addition that was put on about 1930 or so. They used to, when they first laid out the ice field, they marked the first groove by hand. That they used to, when they first laid out the ice field, they marked the first groove by hand. But this is a section of the chain they used to carry the ice up to the uh, run. So in the socket where the uh, oak bar went across to carry the ice. Now this is a horse-drawn plow that they used to cut ice with horses. They would start with a small one like this and gradually progress up to the larger ones. They went as high as 12 inches. This is another one, the next larger size. As I said before, they go up to 12 inches, and it's four different ones. The horses pull them individually. Okay, we're back again. You'll notice that the front teeth are about two inches shorter than the back ones. That's about what they gained each time they made a pass across the ice. These are what they call the ice pikes, used to push the cakes around and pull the flows up the straight uh, channel. You can see they're kind of ugly looking on the end, but they really work. They came in all lengths from 4 or 5 feet up to 12 feet or even more. And down here we have the ice tongs.
The big ones are used to move the blocks of ice around inside the ice house. And the small ones were used to carry the small blocks around in the summertime. We have the hand saw that was used to cut the flows free. So you see the short guy in the movies there working up. See how coarse the teeth are on it. Here we have what they call a needle bar. They use that to break the individual cakes as they went into the water box and fed up the chain.